Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of art, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Novo Day, and today we're going to be discussing art and music, focusing on the electronic duo known as Boards of Canada. To hash it out, I am, of course, joined by one of our executive, exclusive, senior contributors. That's right, the one, the only, the Film Board of America, Mr. Theodore Buck. Buck, welcome. Thank you, thank you. Hello, and welcome to all the Swifties, the Levatics, the Ooh. Beliebers, Ooh. the Selenators. Oh, man. The Cheerios. Okay. Little Monsters, I don't, didn't forget about you. Oh, we'll and, um, thank you. And even to the people that like rappers that have the prefix Lil. Oh, there's okay. There's so many Lil. There's like Lil Pump. Lil Wayne. There's like Lil Yachty. Lil Kim. Yeah, yeah. there's a lot Yachty. right now. <laughs> so yeah, little Yachty. Yeah, if you like him, shout out to you. I'm excited. I, I this is uh, oh man, this has been brewing for a long, this is, um, long time. This is one of my favorites. So um, and yeah. that's why we're talking about it today. As the resident boards of Canada expert in the NDP family, I thought it was perfect subject for us, and more importantly, for Mr. Buck to take the reins. So, uh, Mr. Theodore Buck, why are we talking about BOC today? BOC, Boards of Canada, definitely one of my favorite groups of all time. Uh, you've heard me talk about these guys for hours, mm -hmm. uh, but really they change the way uh, that people look or understand electronic music, specifically like with ambient and IDM genres. They didn't really uh, change the playbook. They kind of burned it. Uh, they're contemporarily Ooh, like that. You know, musicians like Aphex Twin, people that emerged around the same time. Uh, they were still focused on, even though they were kind of a alternative electronic music you would say or idm uh they 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 still um focus on like do you consider it idm though there's a part of me that as i went as we did our homework for this episode i went through their entire discography and they're definitely not edm and i would argue no. that they're maybe not idm but just they're it's they're almost in their own lane it's 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 a yeah. music that holds its own ground in a yeah, lot of ways. no. It, that's why I, I like how you said they burned it. They burned. Yeah, I, I think the, the, the problem is, the is that nobody knows what box to put them in. You Ex know, that's a perfect way to put it. Yeah, and so I don't even know. Like when I when I was really <laughs> trying to think about it, I was like, well, it's electronica, but it's like it's this perfect intersection intersection of where electronica meets jazz, but also and ambient, ambient music, yeah. but also with the occasional thick trip hop drum beat. So I so, I was so curious what you're gonna say about it. Like where's yeah. maybe that's the answer. There is they're they're well, in their very own category. Well, they're in their own lane, be and specifically because of this. When all these con their contemporaries, when they were taking parts of like GABA drum and bass and some some of these, they were using the and utilizing the latest technologies, and it almost was like they were creating music for the future. So it mm -hmm. sounded like you were listening to futuristic music that you would listen to like ten years. From. <laughs> uh, Boards of Canada didn't do that. Uh, I like to say they jumped into their 1983 Toyota Tercel and drove Ooh. completely in the opposite direction. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. they used outdated, uh, cheap. That's broken. why it's like jazz. Yeah, and it's jazz in a way. It's 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 abstract. There's times yeah. when you know it's not it's not always feel good music. It's, no, it's music that it's can transport actually, you. Sometimes it can be a little scary. Yeah, but but really, like when they, jazz, abstract jazz. Yeah, but really, when they utilize that those you know broken, outdated things like tape recorders or broken recording mediums, it gave this like nostalgic sound that that's basically what a lot of people say about them i love what uh the writer simon reynolds of pitchfork he put boards <laughs> of canada say? they avoided the time so they achieved the timeless Ooh. i think that is a perfect that's poetic uh, yes yeah <laughs> and and what i love when you talk about bands that like a lot of critics really love they really kind of start like going through like their their you know oh it's it's musician kind of music it's yeah, musicians this is musicians like made for music, music. like frank yeah. zappa mother of invention yeah. kind of shit. Yeah, I was trying to remember that uh, hand, that handbook that like some really famous writers would keep around next to them that would like teach you the correct prose and, and things to say that would make things more elegant. I think it was Strunk, Strunk and White. Is that right? I oh, oh, do No idea. No idea. Anyway. God, there's, okay. yeah, there's so much to discuss. But of course, before we can do that, we need a little background let me let me take you back to a trip and let me, <laughs> take us this on is, the journey th their take their music is journey. like taking acid okay so uh boards of canada 
as we're talking about, they're also known as Hell Interface. I've never heard them called Hell Interface. I've never heard that. But yeah, I, when I, I saw that I in the outline, that. I was like, Hell Interface, what? Yeah. Uh, so uh, they are Scott, Scottish electronic duo. They were actually brothers. Uh, they go by This is like Michael plot twist. Not, not from Canada. <laughs> yeah, they're not from Canada. Well, they lived from in Canada. Scotland. They, they, they were born in Scotland, lived in Canada when they were kids. Michael Sanderson and Marcus Ely. Uh, but they're Eon? both had Eon? the last name Sanderson. They actually nobody really knew that they were brothers until 2005. More plot twist. Yeah, they yeah, went out of their twist. way to make sure that no one knew that because they didn't want to be another like just, uh, like you know, orbital. orbital. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Jinx, you owe me a drink. You owe me a Coke. Okay. Uh, the so tell us more, st- Buck. They watched a lot of these films by the National Film Board of Canada, which were like oh. educational documentaries, wildlife videos. Yeah. And that's where the name came from boards of canada it actually had a huge influence even on their music their style has been described as evocative mournful sample laden down tempo music sounding as though they produced they was produced on a malfunctioning uh, equipment <laughs> and you'll hear that immediately from the <laughs> ruins of a 1970s computer lab i love that quote oh um, my gosh yes it's it's awesome so it really is i mean when i was listening through when i was going through album after album ep after ep it oozes analog it oozes like oh yeah yeah. We're going to use contemporary technology and break all the fucking rules. We're yeah. going to make it sound like it's broken. It's messed up. It's chopped Do you want to dance to some electronic music? <laughs> Don't listen to them. Yeah. Okay. You're not. That's why. Really that's dance. why. W- yeah. In the thesis, I was like, is this even IDM? I, I don't know. I don't. I, yeah, I feel like it, they're their own thing. They're their own thing. They're their own. They've got their own groove. They've got their own sound. But really, it's it's it, it, it will describe it a little bit more. But a lot of it's garbled speech cut up remix uh you have this uh innate faint childish childish like sounds and and that's what they were trying to do some of it's a little creepy you're like sitting there and i outline one of the songs here that we'll talk about in a little bit but uh they released four studio albums six eps we're going to uh cover one of the eps and then the studio albums because basically yeah how are we we gonna do this today we usually go top to bottom through the albums is that how you want to do it that's how we're going to do it i'm not going to cover all their eps because a lot of them have the same songs but i think two is is a good place to jump in but before we hash it out of course we need a little word from our sponsor this episode is brought to you by the novel the entropy sessions a tale of loss love and madness and our past present and future relationships with technology find it on amazon and as an audiobook through audible your support helps us continue our journey now back to the show so uh, we're going to start with twoism, or do yeah. you want to talk about a little more style and methodology first? Well, I, th- I think we can kind of discuss that and, and jump in definitely while I'm talking here, because you know me with this band, I, I can I can talk about. Oh, for... this this could be a three hour show, guys. Yeah, this could be this could be the show that ends all goddamn and, shows. And you know what? This he's our he's our resident boc expert that's why we're that's why he's leading the pack today speaking of your uh, novel this would be a great soundtrack to like listen to while you're reading it Ooh, ooh, extra plug i like yeah. it i like it a lot well you were talking about um god let's let's jump into twoism 1995 yeah. and you're talking about their methodology how they're making the music yeah well what's funny of is this was this was not a wide release ep oh not um, at all. Th- this yeah. was a self-released ep um they had a hundred copies on cassette tape if you can <laughs> find one of these on ebay they go for thousands of dollars right now yeah, it would be overlooked probably. And remember, this is 1995. So we're still talking about early days of the Internet, but they had a they had a website and um, their webmaster. They were getting so many requests that their webmaster was like, he asked them, hey, can I redistribute this? Can I send files to people or mail them? And they were like, sure. So their uh, webmaster probably should give the most credit for really getting their name out there. He would share this with IDM. He's websites, the one selling them on eBay, lists. too, right? He's the guy. Probably. <laughs> Um, he's making bank now isn't he jesus yeah. we went to the wrong business i think buck fuck no we, we need to we sell all the vintage uh fucking boc albums or eps i know we should have you know i well i was like 11 at the time i should have you know, yeah gathered yeah all it's hard it's harder to know your path when you're 11 or 12 <laughs> and just still watching like dragon ball z and shit yeah but it's 
so it's pretty amazing because i i'm a child of the internet and i remember these mailing lists and things like that uh i didn't it was more i was reading star wars stuff uh that was what i was really into at the time but um, you this know was, get yeah, out of town. ultimately you <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately this led them to get picked up by warp records big label a lot in ele- uh definitely electronic and alternative music um they did have an official like re-release in 20 or 2002 that cd and vinyl so it did get out there but a lot of people didn't know about this until you know after the fact but when you listen to this um right away you understand oh you understand their sound right away it's a fully realized sound you know when we talk about things that are like cinematic and fully realized worlds they knew what they wanted to make immediately and their albums i think are correct me if i'm wrong or if you disagree it's an evolution of that sound they created from the very beginning yeah and so they they really they got together officially in the mid 80s i think it was 85 or 86 but they they were always toying around with this type of music and this kind of sound that you'll see this theme throughout it's evolved really on a lot of visual landscapes and just kind of think themes from their childhood the 70s and 80s and when you jump into the album, it is... It's like you said, it's like the futuristic alien... You're on an alien planet. Well, it's its an experience overall. Because because it's it's not supposed to make you feel comfortable... It, it, at all, sometimes. <laughs> I, I should give you a full disclosure. So yeah. I... This is one of those uh, acts, bands, musical outings that I respect, I love, but I cannot listen to consistently like i can't yeah. put on it's not like that album i can put on and listen to it over and over and over again i have to be in that i have to be in the mood for it a little bit and obviously i put myself in the mood for it for the show but you know when it lands it really lands when i'm in the mood for it and i'm listening to it and i i am not on earth i relate a lot to the sound and and i'll get into a little bit more why but i i want to wait till the next album when we talk about it when they really started kicking off but oh yeah that first track 69er you automatically know that you're in for something different. <laughs> and then the second song comes in. I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's like Orient Canteen or something like that. I don't know. I'm, I'm I, sure just thought of, like I just thought Gaelic. of a genre to put them in. It's not EDM. It's not IDM. Maybe it's ADM, abstract dance music. Maybe. But it's like the sound is haunting. Describe it. Describe. It. So for if, if there's someone, if you've never heard this before in your goddamn life, put us put us in the driver's seat. How do you, how would you explain it? It's like if you found an old cassette tape of like um, ambient music or that's supposed to sound kind of happy and uh, maybe I'm making I'm probably making is it, it sound happy much worse. to you? I find that fascinating. Some of it some of it is and some of it isn't and there's very yeah. reasons why. But it's almost like ambient music that you would hear in the background. But you know that tape that's not working fully right or the tape player and it's kind of like the track is off. So it's got that wobbly kind of sound which yeah. almost makes it sound a little. Weird. I'm there. I'm with you. That's it. Yes. That's, that's yeah, it. That it's is like, kind of it, words of Canada. Yeah. I always think of them as musical vignettes. Like they're not fully realized. I mean, I think to them, they're full, they'll they're fully fleshed out pieces, but when you hear it, you feel like there may be something more to this. That's why I always thought they would have been perfect, and they still are. This is a plug for them. I know they're big fans of the show. So let's go ahead and say <laughs> hi to the Sand- <laughs> the Sanderson <laughs> brothers uh real quick and say, guys, I don't know why you haven't gotten into film scoring yet your music oh my p- they perfect for film scores perfect for film scoring seriously right yeah I, and that's kind of what it is it's like film scores yes um and and when we get to some of the others we'll 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 explain why um but yeah you saw a lot of foreshadowing so that was that was their ep you you kind of yeah. you started hearing the sound and understanding you're starting to get these samples of like random samples of people talking but you couldn't really <laughs> understand but distorted and distorted and rough and there's a grit to it and that's why there's there is a haunting essence to some of their pieces it becomes very moody and atmospheric and a little scary uh not in a boo horror movie scary no, just in it's a, not in, a scary, just in this tonal yeah. texture way that is just otherworldly is probably a better word that's why just like an alien movie it's not always scary it just it's foreign right it's so foreign it's so different yeah so like two nights ago i was i was trying to explain to somebody what what they are and i said um i've always considered their sound too another way i put it to people is it sounds like place between 
awake and sleep is their music to me that is yeah because like it's like that when your dreams when you you hear somebody it's talk called twilight it's but i don't like yeah. saying twilight because people think of the movies when i say twilight. oh yeah it's not that twilight skin. sparkling yeah. skinned <laughs> and robert vampires. pattinson and his beautiful and jawline yeah. yeah okay <laughs> let's pull it back let's do a double pull back we're going to jump to 1998 oh okay we're 1998 and that's when they kind of came onto the scene and people started really knowing them and that was from music has the right to children that's the name of that album that this is their first the monumental first breakout album album. yeah breakout right away out of the gates probably the most popular release of the group if if you if you look on spotify it's the all almost the top five songs are from there except one which we'll talk about here in a minute and how do you pronounce that probably their most famous piece from that famous album roy viv roy g biv so it has roy to do G-Biv? with the colors oh okay like the colors. i thought it was from, like a one word from a different language so like red orange kind of like how Apex yellow. twin does different language he does that yeah in, in some of that language or something yeah and if you'll notice a lot of their um a lot of the titles have to do with geometry, math, like science kind of things. This was um, really highly regarded. Pitchfork said it was the best psychedelic album of the 90s. Um, they also ranked it as a number 35. This this kind of changed the game because um, nobody had ever heard anything like this before. And they're true blue looping techniques you know this is tape looping where they actually cut tape to make the loop and you can hear it because like we're spoiled with like we're spoiled with the pro tools and the ableton kind of loops where everything perfectly goes into the first beat of the bar where this one you can hear the 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 sound or music or whatever was created from the looping cut off immediately right that hard cut oh yeah you can hear it like right in it yeah it's it's not clean but it's it's not not clean exactly yeah that's a good way to put it it's not clean but that but it creates i think that that sound they literally pioneered uh with those techniques and you hear it right from the beginning so like a lot of their albums do you ever remember he's like a kid in a candy (laughs) store i'm so glad we did this show because he has this smile on his face that is like he's a little kid again talking about his favorite trying to remember Okay, so like when you watch PBS, I'm like trying to, PBS, I'm like Big yeah. Bird, Sesame Street PBS. I, I'm trying to make sure I got it. So yeah, when you watched it, there would always be <laughs> a post credit scene, and it would be like this, like very 1970s synthesizer sound, and it was for WGBH Boston. Okay, and I can't mimic the sound, but it's like <laughs> like something like that. So you, when you were listening to it or you saw it on the screen, I remember this from watching PBS as a kid. You knew that like sesame street or like one of the shows that they produce were coming up gotcha. and th- the first song in this is like that it's like like an introduction it's like this introduction that you're like maybe that was influenced when they watched board uh the national film board of canada huh? their little presentation jingle uh before it came up so it's like you're getting ready to watch like a wildlife uh well <laughs> the, the title of the song is wildlife analysis right um it's like you're getting introduced to a 1970s educational video and then all of a sudden the next track uh, eagle in your mind you get these really haunting sounds this garbled speech <laughs> like you, you're trying to listen like what is he saying what are they saying in there and then it really it's almost like a downscale dnb sound but it never fully gets there you got a little bit of a beat but you're like trying to wait for it to like kind of get to going. open up yeah it, it's almost I feel like, like a lot of their music is that bit. way yeah yeah it's like you're always waiting for something to open up but that <laughs> what you don't realize is that's the sound that they wanted to make they wanted to make this textured textured is a great yeah. word for their their sound it there's is a lot like of texture feel the sound yeah yeah exactly like with your hands um <laughs> not the color of fire anything. is the third track and all of a sudden you start hearing these like childlike noises it's almost like listening to nursery rhymes I and know, it makes this... me think of apex twin though when they yes. use samples like this is they use vocals as you know how we talk about using vocals as an instrument this is the epitome of that where they are distorting them and manipulating them so much that Mm -hmm. you know it's someone talking or you know it's some a repeated phrase you know it's a vocal from how our human condition has evolved to be able to hear that so well in other people but it's 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 mixed in so intellectually that you can't you can't distinguish it you can't really understand what's coming out 
no of the phrasing and then it just creates more texture from it well and that's the thing and that's why i always kind of described it as that it's like music for the place between awake and sleep because like in dreams you'll have like these conversations but you can't really remember or make out what people are saying but you know mm-hmm. they're talking in your dreams well it's like um i guess yeah i don't want to use twilight again but like insomniacs kind of know that state very well where they're not quite asleep but they're not quite awake kind yeah. of thing and uh, this is the soundtrack for that, right? <laughs> Every time you bring up Twilight, I want to play like I want to have like a soundboard where I, I just think of Rod hit that Paramore song or whatever it is. Beautiful face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I won't. I won't try to sing it. He's a, he's a handsome man. Uh, he is. Uh, I he, get he's, it. He's, and I've liked him line. in a lot of movies recently. And well, um, he did. He did. He did what uh, Matthew McConaughey did with his McConaughey. We went through a, um, a, a Pattinson. <laughs> we went through a Robert Pattinson evolution where started out in Harry Potter, started out in Harry Potter, and then he did the Twilight stuff. And we all thought he was just going to stay in that lane forever. And then he broke through. He broke out, and he was. I. I, I first. I. Well. I noticed it before this, but with uh, Tenet, I feel like it landed. I was like, okay, this guy's on a brand new level. He was fantastic. He was so charming, and so he was perfect for that role. But let's pull it back. Let's pull it back. Let's let's bring it back. Let's do a buck pullback. Go ahead, buck. Yeah, so, I mean, like I said, you get these childlike voices. The next track after that, Aquarius... Or and I they had an EP called Aquarius, back. right? 19, yeah. 1998. And it was this was one of the songs on there. But again, the song Aquarius, it's got a beat. But then like throughout the whole thing, there's like a lady just counting. Right. Like, oh, yes. Right. And then and it's then, like, it's not even in order, right? Or is no, that of a different not. piece, right? It kind of goes all over the place. And then you hear like these kids lo- like giggling in the background. Yes. And then you hear a, a uh, you remember these things? like a speak and spell it was those orange things that you would type in words and it would say the word uh yeah kind of i kind of remember that and it, definitely yeah. i remember seeing and, that from they took one of those and they, it, it just says orange and it's <laughs> orange. just like <laughs> throughout I, what i'm describing some people I, okay this is what i'm thinking a lot of people are listening right now is like they're like this is fucking up nuts shit. yeah there, I tell and, you, and well, we should warn people. <laughs> you will probably hate it. Yeah, we should. You might warn hate people. it, but you might if love you, it at the same time. I feel like if you if you don't have a good foundation for these this kind of music, and that's why yeah. I used Frank Zappa as a good uh, analogy. It's not going to be for everyone. Uh, no, but no. great art is something that you can appreciate and respect, and you don't have to listen to it every day while you're yeah. commuting to your fucking job, right? No. Um, it, these are the kind of albums you'll probably listen to once and you'll get it and then you'll probably put it down for a long time unless you're yeah. getting nostalgic again just wanted to highlight some favorite songs on here that i like obviously an eagle in your mind you have telephasic workshop which has a lot of that garbled mixed up uh speech in it a uh, turquoise hexagon sun which is probably the <laughs> great, biggest great name yeah okay. i want to say it's the or one of the i guess roy b jiv is the most popular uh, yeah. track on this but this is turquoise hexagon sun turquoise uh or hexagon sun is what they named their studio that they they oh, built i didn't um, know that's that. the okay. name of their studios i they... learn a lot in these shows that's why we do this we, yeah it's, we're educational um educational. why i like turquoise hexagon sun the first time i listened to it it feels like you're in the co- sitting in the corner of either a party or a really chill party or family gathering and you're tripping <laughs> while you're hearing it because you can hear it, it's I'm playing this high like, as really right kind now. of pretty m- melodic sound and then in the background you just hear like really faint um chatter hmm. it, it, yeah it, um and then roy b jiv uh roy g biv excuse me uh the most popular track probably the most accessible out of all these yeah no i think that's probably why i think that's why favorites. it's the most it is very digestible yeah um, and then Olsen. So Olsen, I love this song. It sounds like a song you should be listening to while you're sitting on the top of a mountain while the sun is rising. Ooh, and folks, I've imagery. done this before. Yeah, we're, we're with you. We're right there with you. I have done this before because what the first time I heard the song, I was like, someday I'm going to go up to a mountain and I'm going to have a playlist <laughs> and I'm just going to watch the sunrise. And this was on it. Um, so really love that. How romantic of you. It is very romantic. That's, yeah, that's the way I, I like am. it. Yeah. All right. Ladies single ladies know all these things <laughs> hey okay 2002 we're heading on ooh, we're marching ooh. on folks oh keep, let's go going. G- geo uh Gatti? geo Gatti. Gatti. geo Gatti. i think okay. it's geo Gatti. okay geo Gatti sounds right yeah um 
this is my favorite album of theirs. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I, um, I I I knew we were going to get there eventually. I'm I yeah. I'm I'm a Campfire Head Phase guy. Okay. Um, the third LP and yeah. probably a close second is Tomorrow's Harvest. Tomorrow's Harvest. Is it good. sounds like you're a little more in the beginning. I'm a little more at the end, which we yeah. always find ourselves, don't we, Buck? We're always yes. like on the same page, but we're the other side of that coin. Two sides of the same coin. Uh, why why why, why Geo Gotti? I'm curious. I'm cu- I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Um, why Geo Gotti? <laughs> it, it, it's a little like I said. A lot of a lot of great tracks, especially ambient. Something that I listen to a lot during late nights, especially when I was in grad school. Those two to four a.m. like Don't times where me. I was yeah. uh, typing out my thesis and all night, hoping and everything you, well. would come out and. Uh, processing all my algorithms and things like that that i did Uh, Um, algorithms yeah Um, which i did i did i actually (laughs) did that but anyway i think that that's why it has a special place because it kind of reminds me it it just kind of felt kind of matched my mood at the time yeah it felt right for the felt right felt like a good soundtrack so i listened to this a lot back it was romantic Um, and it felt right circa 2000 romantic and it feels right okay okay (laughs) here we go ladies um but really again you start this album out, it's totally different again. All, all of a sudden, you realize right from the beginning, this is a much darker uh, sound. And there's some reasons behind that. Uh, this was universally acclaimed as well, um, mm-hmm. almost more than their previous album. Which is crazy lot- to me when I think about it. I thought it would it would be universally hated out, out of the gates, but it was universally loved. It was loved. But I think, but you know, I am shocked that people clung to it so quickly. You know, yeah, usually this kind of stuff, the hard to digest stuff, it goes through that phase of everybody hates it and then enough time goes by and then everybody loves it. Right. We see that all the time. And I think you did see a little bit of that with him. But I think this one's even harder to digest than the previous album. I agree with that. This one was a little more of a challenge. It's it's a challenging uh, in, listen. In a good way. In a good in, in way. A good but way. A, yeah. And it, it was a little bit of a challenge. It's I like think, if you're way. trying to listen to free jazz, don't maybe don't jump into, you know, yeah. some albums. Like, it's just brew right away. I was gonna, listen that's to what ki- I was gonna say bitches listen brew. Listen to kind of blue like, first. Yeah. <laughs> it's like don't uh, jump into bitches brew and expect that you'll Yeah. Start with kind of blue it. and then bitches brew later. Yeah. It's when it's called the pee your pants man okay <laughs> so uh they recorded 90 tracks for this originally i i read it was maybe it was uh a, a later album i thought it was like 400 compositions and they narrowed it down probably to, maybe i'm thinking of music has the right to children where it was like 400 pieces and they narrowed it down to 90 something and they narrowed those down to 20 something oh we should talk about that in terms yeah. of st- stylistic approaches these pieces are short and yes it's it, we see a lot of 17 18 tracks per album that's only an hour yeah. you know that's a lot of tracks to just fill up an well, hour this you know one, usually would have a double lp for that that's a good segue because the Ooh. play length of this is 66 minutes and six seconds oh i didn't know that mark the, the reason it is <laughs> Because the president of Warp Records said, you know what would be kind of funny is if you made it that length and then people would think that this uh, album was made by the devil. And for years. And they did, right? And they did. (laughs) Yeah, and for years this has always been considered some sort of satanic, or there's been s- subliminal I messaging. Didn't know that yeah, they they did do some of it in here, and I, I I think that's almost too much to talk about in this. There are some really good. We only YouTube, got an hour, right? We only got an hour. There's some YouTube <laughs> videos that really break some of this stuff down. But here's here's the crazy thing. Okay, okay. Years later, when people were or not years later, but people when they were ripping it and in, into wave files, when you add it up the file sizes yeah. all together it came out to 666 megabytes oh jesus christ so they really i mean they thought they really gave this some thought this is like the apex twin thing where everybody's like oh what yeah the hell you put is it that weird sound and you put it through a, a spectrometer and you see it and his it's face. his face yeah i remember that you showed me that many yeah. months ago yeah. yeah there's a lot of mathematic and biblical allusions throughout the album there are you know so this is like crazy smart like almost easter egg uh planting. oh Especially with like <laughs> the Branch Davidian stuff. Like, yeah, they say David Crush, Branch Davidian. They're really into that. If you don't know, oh, about like the the occult, the occult. Yeah. So, kind of so stuff. David Crush, yeah, Waco, Texas, the whole 
that bad thing that happened in the 90s uh you know if you don't know about i it, actually don't know all of the history oh you there. don't know i need i, I really a, need to research it so there is if actually you can a give decent, me a, a sentence or two yeah so basically david koresh was a leader of the branch davidians which are kind of a christian cult um basically he was the leader and he could sleep with all the women and have all oh, the God. kids but yeah it's one of those things not a great guy but probably didn't deserve <laughs> oh no one. really he sounds like no, a great guy. no 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 but <laughs> But no, what I happened, don't. a lot of people died, and it was by the hands of the ATF and the FBI, and uh, probably shouldn't have happened. They probably weren't as a th- a much of a threat, but in the 90s, there were a lot of these things that were happening, Ruby Ridge, a lot of things like that. A lot of people have very strong opinions about those. I don't want to get into that that much, but there is a good, um, I actually quite thought it was a pr- pretty well done uh, miniseries. Uh, that starred Taylor Hirsch as uh, David Koresh. Um, I think it's on Paramount, but it's actually it's a good miniseries about the whole ordeal. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, it was it, it's me- it was messed up on both sides. It, if you want to go down the rabbit hole further, this is a good this is a good. It, it's place good to because do it. it's a yeah. It, it impacted. I remember as a kid in the '90s when it happened. Um, it was terrible. Officers got hurt. A lot of people died from it. It was it was terrible. Anyway, yeah. Um, let's let's go on a happier note. <laughs> uh, uh, why why is such the dark sound uh, in here? Yeah. Well, um, they recorded uh, Michael Sanderson. He said that when they made this album, it was a record, uh, some sort of trial by fire. It was claustrophobic, mm-hmm. twisting journey that takes you into some pretty dark experiences until you reach the air again. And what he what he was talking about is nine eleven had a huge impact on this album they were recording it while it was happening so he said that a lot of this was them um trying to like basically it was a cathartic experience where they were trying to put get it in the art i always say that put it yeah, in the he, art and they he did. said geo Gotti was kind of exercising demons after the attacks a lot of numerology like i said biblical uh, references hinduism things like that the name of the this is a very uh thinking man or thinking woman think, thinking person excuse person's kind of album yeah thinking or music. person's album this was uh it's still considered one of the greatest idm albums of all time it's pitch it's number five on pitchforks idm album again i don't know how you can it's not really an idm <laughs> album um, yeah i would say adm i'm gonna use that yeah, from my favorite abstract dance music yeah my favorite songs on here um and some highlights yeah, music is math tough. uh i like it just when i first saw the title i love that because music is is math that is that's, that's, that's true um julie candy sessions, uh 1969 is my favorite track on here um this is where they do the branch davidian stuff i remember playing this <laughs> in college when somebody this <laughs> and I had a lady left friend, the party no. <laughs> i had a lady friend over it was after hours she asked me what kind of music I listened to. I said, if you really want to hear some weird shit, I played 1969 off of this album. And she said, oh, how, how, how did that go? Not raw. Yeah, not raw. <laughs> that was going to be my guess. Uh, it takes a special well, yeah. person. Yeah, not just yeah. gal to uh, be like, ooh, you probably would have been b- better playing, you know, Aphex Twin Air. Air probably been a, a better yeah, down tempo be or, or zero seven or something. The ladies like zero seven. C- uh, C- that C- is like the C- furthest C- cousin to fucking boards of Canada you can get just because they're both down tempo music. Zero seven. Uh, yeah, I had that was in the one that I used to play a lot. And people. And fun like, fact: Sia what is used this? to Sia yeah. used to be in zero seven. See, uh, they had a lot of guests. wigs all the time. Yeah, th- that was the first time I ever saw C- Sia, so I-, I could not understand why. And actually, she had some albums before that where she wasn't wearing wigs or covering her face. Yeah, no, not. she was. You can see what she looks like. That was that was definitely yeah. a, a Sia solo thing. Once she got popular, she's like, ah, I think I want to. I want to with... put a mask on. Essentially, don't want. I think be she worked at. a lot with Be- Beck, or she's good friends with him. And then Nigel she Bridget. actually writes a lot of songs for a lot of people, including Beyonce. Yeah. She's incredibly talented. Like I think, oh my god, yes, and she's got pipes. Crazy. Before she was real poppy, yeah, yeah. Before she was real poppy, she was really known in those alternative music scenes. Like Uh, just having an amazing voice, like zero seven, yeah, like zero seven. That was that was you know I I I think of when I would ask other people like what kind of music you're into. I feel like I got like they thought they were introducing something wildly underground to me they're like yeah, yeah. i'm really into zero seven the, I'm like, here, okay and i'll just kind of play happened. along <laughs> be like okay yeah. and it is it is nice music it's nice down tempo music uh, but it's um it's definitely the distant cousin 
two boards of Canada. Oh, and yeah. This, and, and these and, and all their other contemporaries, right? Like Air. Oh, well, I love Air. I, I love Air. Yeah. Uh, that uh, Playground Love is one of the oh, greatest yeah. songs I think has ever been written. But um, no, that. so this is how that happened. This is, this is my theory because this is how I found out about Zero Seven. You watched... Guess what movie you watched? Oh, fuck me. Give me a hint. Um, I, Zach Braff, I, Natalie Portman. Oh, uh, oh, uh, Garden State. They were in Garden State soundtrack. Yes. And so when people, because that, that was, was like, that was like the that underground was the movie. Soundtrack. I remember when people were like, freshman really year in the college. movies, and you, and they thought that was real underground. And I'm like, okay, what is it? Garden State. Garden State and boom. And I was like, eh, it's okay. It was okay. I don't I don't think it was it was breaking any, you know, glass ceilings. Yeah, but that soundtrack was played all over. I but knew But that was a good soundtrack, yeah. That yeah, was my the girlfriend college. at the time, all of her friends were listening to it and they they thought it was like They thought it was the and- underground shit that no one you know that they were really showing something new to us, but they didn't know us. They didn't know that we. But they didn't out know us. So I, I give them credit because there were bands like the Shins and stuff like you didn't know about. Simon Garfunkel was on that album. Kind of introduced a lot of people to some new music. So I'm not. Oh hate yeah, on don't it. get me wrong. It was. It was. It did. But that's did. why they all fought Open Zero Seven because Zero Seven was like the most. Yo, know, Zero Seven was like the most uh, band thing at the album. time. Right. We could have a show on Zero Seven. I guess. No, I, I feel like that's not. I don't know if that's uh, deep no. enough of a cut for our show. We're doing know. it now. This is our tribute to Zero Seven right it, now Zero and Seven the Boards of Canada episode. It was like a good makeout. Oh, it was it was a good it was good between date like two thousand three and two thousand seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let's go back to the complete opposite. Geo God. Yeah, let's let's go back to <laughs> let's music go back that to the dark dystopian hellscape. But yeah, I, I again I, I wrote on our notes where I said it's it's that point between dreaming being awake or being asleep and being then awake. how do you let's segue to the campfire head phase 2005 do you feel i feel like these are still dark albums all together honestly i i think this is the most digestible album out of all of them. the campfire head phase yeah with, oh yeah with a, and tomorrow's with a harvest i thought tomorrow's harvest was fairly digestible yeah but i think this That's is 2013 when... they took a long break to do a bunch of eps in the middle oh yeah yeah but this is campfire... <laughs> they still were making music just not folding lps well, yeah, they they were. We'll we'll get to that in a second. I I have I have some tidbits of information on. Oh, give it to us. Uh, the campfire head phase. All right, two thousand five. Let's set the scene for it. You're sitting late at night watching MTV. You see a image <laughs> of a man jumping out of a balloon in high altitude space, falling down with this amazing song. This introduction. He's falling through space and falling down through the atmosphere. And then all of a sudden he hits the water. <sighs> you hear an acoustic guitar. Well, not acoustic. Um, I think it was an electric guitar, but it was. Zoom. You hear a, a strum of an electric guitar, and then you see waves and people surfing. That is the uh, probably the song that you first heard of if you ever did not know who Boards of Canada were or was. But uh, Dave and Cowboy, um, probably mm-hmm. one of their most successful uh, singles from that. It's been in a lot of commercials. Awesome That's song. That's where. I'm I'm glad you said that because I feel like this kind of music that's where their their home is a lot of the time is yeah. commercials you know yeah yeah and this is this is this album is again from the start different I mean they outside kinda, of the LPs obviously is yeah if they, if they were to sell the rights to put it into something else it's usually commercials and and the sound is different it's it's a lot it's we had a lot of those textures with a lot of the the samples and things like that. They stripped those out. This is a lot more acoustic. Is it still weird? Oh, yeah. But it's definitely more digestible. So you had, like, arguably their most familiar popular track, Dave and Cowboy. It's a significant departure in both mood and themes, like I said. Um, then its predecessors. Uh, Michael Sanderson said, again, we tried to make an escape a soundtrack, kind of like a sanctuary, a Dayglo Vista that you can go uh, visit by putting out the record on. So a lot of this, like I said, it's stripped down. The reason they wanted to do this is because people were starting to call them formulaic. They were kind of relying Mm. on the sound too much. And they actually came out and said, yeah, that was part of the thing is that you have to be self-conscious about that a little bit as a band. Because if you don't do that, then you can't expand and try different things and come up with new sounds and kind of grow as a musician overall. The biggest thing and why I love this album, too, and it, it definitely hits with me is because I spend a lot of time traveling to the co- the state I live in now, Colorado. It's definitely the album is inspired by the North American Western landscape. They wanted to create something that sounded like a 70s soundtrack uh, for a road trip through Western U.S. and desert 
uh, highways. Um, <laughs> I think they nailed it. I think and I it, think they nailed I think it. They, yeah, I think I think that is it. It's not it's not their most critically acclaimed album, but it's definitely uh, it's still got really good reviews on it. Highlights: Satellite Anthem, Icarus, Peacock Tail, um, Dave and Cowboy. I think it's a great song to listen to first thing when you wake up in the morning. If you haven't seen the music video, do yourself a favor. It's pretty cool. And slow this bird down. Uh, I <laughs> love this song. It is. Again, it's that that ambient myth, you know, kind of mysterious sound that it's not doesn't make you excited or happy, but it just like kind of fits the mood when you're just trying to chill and relax. Um, then they took a long break, yes. break, and uh, that um, leads us to tomorrow's harvest, 2013. 2013. You get some. I weird... feel like this is still uh, very digestible, like the campfire head. Yeah, that's why I would say it's a close second to my favorite of. Uh, of the of the four main LPs, yeah, it's it's really influenced by seventies uh, and eighties soundtracks, uh, film sound scores, much like a lot of uh, most of their history, most of their work is is still there in the in those lanes. Yeah, but but this one it has more of an atmospheric and ethereal kind of like sound. To yes, it. Like, yes, I'll agree with that. Um, I I have described it. Uh, some of their songs almost okay. Nineteen eighties. <laughs> Don't think too hard. No, I I know. But but they they definitely have like a specific sound that sounds almost John Carpenter esque. So John Carpenter, Halloween from Halloween fame. Um, but he he Big wrote a lot of his China. own scores. Yeah, he did al- almost all of them except for the for his things. films. Yeah, yeah. He's a very good musician. He, he wrote that triplet, you know, little piano melody that is the Halloween theme. Yeah. Uh, the most famous probably horror theme of all time. So it's definitely got more atmospheric sound, still that kind of stripped down sound. It was really interesting when this came out. They they had all these cryptic codes that people would use and decipher and they get on their in the interwebs and talk about it <laughs> interwebs that makes that makes total sense based on the 666 thing you told me that i had no fucking idea even existed about yeah. the lore that is boards of canada so this makes sense that they were to push into those kind of mediums to get these sounds out and ha- have different experiences with their art yeah and it was it was it was really cool because at the time the community was getting together and trying to figure out what do all these codes mean? And at the end of it, uh, again, there's YouTube videos about this. Are you doing it too? I, I was actually involved with it, yes. <laughs> um, basically, what we found at the end of it was it sent us to a link, and it was basically some information that a new album was coming out when it was and kind of another song sample. So it was it was kind of an Easter egg hunt. We fucking, oh God, we love that shit. And yeah. uh, when it comes to art, I think uh, our NDP family loves the the deep cuts, the Easter eggs. How we can we can connect the dots, the numerology, whatever it is. It, it's uh, it, it adds, I, I can't get enough of it. I eat it up. Well, it's the experience factor. I mean, yeah. And so, and a lot of other mediums have tried to do this. Um, I but I will say this: I, I do love what All Music said. Um, when they came out with a review for it, they said the album is filled with melancholy melodies and subtly edgy rhythms, adding it is as comforting as a collection of quietly menacing Android fever dreams. Android fever dreams? Android fever dreams. I got it. I love that quote. They nailed that on the head again. Yeah. And they love the album. Some favorite tracks. uh, I think the most popular reach for the dead, white cyclosa, nothing is real and come to dust. That's what the one I feel like it's like listening to the soundtrack of Ninja Gaiden or Shinobi uh, feels like yes. an eight bit video game theme in the background. Definitely feels like that, those 70s and 80s soundtracks. And there you have it, folks. Top to bottom. You've heard me blabber more than ever. I know. I liked it. I um, so take us as I, I normally say here at the end, Buck, take us home. Why did the good people need to get in to the boards of Canada. You know, I think they're the one of the most interesting, misunderstood, and underappreciated artists in the past 25 years. I really do. They hold a special place uh, with me, along with artists like Aphex Twin, for example, who you introduced yeah. me to, actually. Yes. Um, Did I? I don't, the, I don't feel like... I feel like we already... Well, okay. I, I could have sworn you already knew it before me, and, I but we got into was. it. We got into him more because... I, I think you... You were you, already into him. I knew him from... So I was like the catalyst, uh, not the beginning. 
I only <laughs> knew him from two songs. It was Come, Come to Daddy and Window Licker. Yeah. But those are, uh, those are classics too. Yeah. Those are bangers. Come to, to Daddy's day. awesome. Yeah. It's still still one of my favorites. <laughs> it's still it's still a banger. And Rubber Johnny's another good uh music video there too that uh will give you nightmares. Or but Window Licker. Jesus Christ. Oh, window Licker's awesome, dude. That that video is just, oh god. It's weird in the best ways possible. Oh, it's it's excellent. Well, let's let's not sidetrack too much. Yeah, so Aphex Twin, Boards of Canada, they introduced me to a sound I didn't know that existed in a genre that I usually overlooked. I was not real into dance music, IDM, whatever you want to call it. Um, this these are soundtracks for late nights, early mornings, uh, for me during college study sections, sessions that in my playlist I had Dave Van Cowboy, 69er, Turquoise, Heck hexagon sun these were all on here um for me and so they hold kind of this special place when i was going through a lot trying to get stuff done you know you're you're trying to battle through school and get there and get to that finish line and this is something that i always had in the background going this is the soundtrack this is the soundtrack to you getting to that finish line exactly in a way and that's yeah. why it's it's so special for me. And and I want to say, you know, we cover a lot of topics on the show, and I hope we introduce you to something new that you'll end up enjoying. This has got to be new to so many people. I feel if like you're already this a is fan, a deep cut. Yeah. And if yeah. you're a fan, maybe this will bring you back and give you some time to or make you want to revisit an old musical gym. So definitely check them out. I'll I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> Guys, thank you for listening. There you have it, Boards of Canada from top to bottom. But before we go, you know we got a little more for you and a little icing on the cake, a little cherry for that Sunday with what we call the Gem of the Week. If you don't know what the Gem of the Week is, it's essentially something we like to talk about here at the end of our shows that doesn't always fit perfectly into the scheme of the episode, but we got to give it to you nonetheless because it may be on our radar in the last day, month. We just want to give you so you guys can dig deeper. Um, I have a few um okay. and uh two of them are connected to music one is very much connected to the world that is boards of canada and i'm going to leave that for the end uh the first one is i finally got around to seeing quest loves quest loves summer of soul doc still have not seen that yet this is the, the black um quote unquote black woodstock uh, going on at the same time as the as the famous classic Woodstock festival that we all know. And it was exactly what the reviews have said it is. It has opened my eyes to a world that I, I'd, I'd really didn't even know myself. And it was uh, expertly directed and made by Questlove and all of the footage. I'm shocked at how much footage they had from this, <laughs> this uh, festival. Seeing a young 19-year-old Stevie Wonder play um, in this live setup was spellbinding. Like, you know, when we talk about prodigies, prodigies yeah. and prodigious musicians, and but to see it uh, really captured in a way that is exquisite in this uh, film version is is something to behold. Um, number two is I finally got around to seeing Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley. This is uh, definitely still want to see that. Yeah, in the camp of you know something like Boards of Canada, this movie just to just to connect it in some way is not going to be for everyone. I can see why it, um, some some negative reviews are coming out because it's a slow burn. It's a character piece. It's a morality tale. And it doesn't have the normal del Toro shtick, which is like, you know, the monsters, the pans lamp labyrinth stuff. There's no monsters at all in it. In fact, uh, spoiler alert. Uh, it's it's a deep character study about con artists and uh, carny folk and culture. And it tells you a lot about who you are in the human condition. Hold on a second. So there's no interspecies sex in this one? No, no interspecies sex. Like, well, then oh, I'm out. The shape, I'm out. The shape of Water? Was that I'm out. what it was? Yeah. I love that movie, but I... I, it, I do I love that movie too, but it is weird. I don't want to run out of time, so I'll say real quick, the last thing... Uh, that I do want to recommend that maybe if you're having a hard time getting into boards of Canada or something like that, the musician that I grew up with that I fell in love with that is close to this lane. It's definitely not. It's it's a little more digestible. It's a little more it's a little more um, danceable jazz type of electronica. And that is Amon Tobin. I've ab absolutely Amon been Tobin, in love with. I love him. Yeah, I have absolutely been in love with Amon Tobin. Yeah. since I uh, got into him, and that's the album I want to recommend is okay. uh, Super Modified. 
Super. Yeah. Uh, that is the album that made me fall, fell in love with this musician. And um, I think it'll be, I, I think it could help change you as well. I like the sound in the song slowly. And yeah. at the end of the day, yeah. those are my more jam. songs that are in commercials that yeah. you've, been, you've been touched <laughs> by, but you didn't know. Who yeah. They were. Yeah. I don't have a gym per se, but occasionally okay. i do Abstract i do gym. have some okay. words of wisdom i'd like to say okay i think we all need to re- be reminded sometimes is that a lot of things don't really matter except people we have a lot of things and we have a lot of we have a lot we're very uh fortunate to have all, we, all that we have but in the end of end of the day what really matters is uh taking care of not only yourself but your family and your friends and your neighbors and really being trying to being a part of community and that's really what matters at the end of the day and and being there for others because um man life is short and there's a lot out there that we fight and argue about uh that and just it don't, doesn't matter at the it end it doesn't of the day. matter at the end of the day you let know, it go let yeah. it go be there for each other when somebody needs some help reach out because you never know when you need it um i think that's a perfect place to stop as always if you like that you can check us out at at underscore Novo underscore day and day is DE and at Novo day media. You can of course check out our products on Novo day productions.com. There you'll find, uh, novels like the entropy sessions post meridium adulteration and much more to come don't forget to like and subscribe follow hit that notification bell do all the things rate and review and until next time just as buck said be good to each other and as always good luck and godspeed we love you art of the beholder is brought to you by novo day productions created and hosted by novo day and the novo day collective facebook.com slash novo day media at novo day media on twitter and instagram Music by A Company, facebook.com slash ACO Music 123, ACO on Spotify. Logo designed by Tom Justice, J E S T U S, of thejusticecompany.com, and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved.